a train is a linear like film it has one car after another like the film has one frame after another and so there's many references that cross reference between train and film I, I of course was very aware of it but it isn't a main concern in this film I think what I wanted to uh, to introduce into the film was that the the train has been here for so many years. Uh, in fact, in the in 1900, the fa fastest thing on earth was the train, which is hard to to imagine today. Uh, and that the history of American railroads is pretty much built on greed and and fraud, uh, land fraud and bond fraud. And uh, now it's, it's one of the main uh, systems to move goods around the country, so it, it's the infrastructure for capitalism, of course. And I myself became very aware of it standing next to uh, train tracks and seeing all of these goods go past me. Uh, for two years, uh, uh, seeing a train pulling uh, SUVs this way and then oil truck train coming this way and that, the one that passes, uh, I became somewhat aware of that. Because of that, I wanted to uh, make references to history. So you hear a baseball game from 1991. It's a very famous game where Nolan Ryan is pitching a no-hitter. And then you hear a Coke commercial after that, which is from 1970, sung by Karen Carpenter. It, th those are icons that are somewhat familiar in the U.S. You also hear Eisenhower's farewell address from 1960, where he wa warns the nation against the military-industrial complex. And everything he warns us about, of course, has come true. Um, uh, the misuse of power uh, bet between the military and, and the industrial uh, people who make war goods. The Eisenhower speech I put over a, a two mile long coal train and he's talking about the wealth of America and the need for a military, but then he, he flips it on us. And it's quite interesting that a Republican president that was an ex-general is warning us against the military industrial complex and uh, that uh, somehow we didn't take heed of that. If, if anybody's giving that warning, it's, it seems like he would be the one to listen to. And so I wanted to put it over this coal train that represents this kind of wealth and uh, abundance of one, all these cars the same. Uh, but then I put it in particular places because I wanted to spread out uh, those sound over uh, things throughout the film. I didn't want them to bunch up, so there's approximately one per roll, really. Um, at, at one point, the whole soundtrack was going to be the Bible, uh, because I had just, uh, while I was making this film, I was listening to Christian radio, and I had never read the Bible. And uh, the, the Christian radio that I was listening to was interpreting the Bible in a very literal way. And, and not knowing what the Bible was about, I, I read the Bible that summer. And um, it somewhat frightened me when you use these literal interpretations. And now that kind of uh, right-wing uh, fundamentalism in the U.S. Uh, uses religion to kind of uh, build the right-wing cause, so that, that somewhat frightened me. So I wanted to make a reference to the Bible because of that also. Um, and then there's, uh, there's a part of Woody Guthrie's song, This Land is Your Land, This Land is My Land, which becomes kind of an anthem for America, except that the stanza that I play has been removed from it. Uh, so when the school kids sing it, they don't sing about the sign that says there's pri private property, but that didn't say anything on the back, meaning we can come in from the other side. And uh, this land is your land, mine. That stanza has been removed from that song, so I wanted to put that back mm -hmm. in, into this. So I, I want to make some political references to, and, and uh, historical references, so one would somewhat think of the history of trains and uh, I know it's kind of a, a far jump, but I, th I didn't want this just to be a romanticizing of, of trains, even though there's that part of it that, uh, like I said, it was the fastest machine in, in 1900. And, and uh, 
The other, the other reason I made the film is because railroads can't go more than a 2% grade, and because of that, they describe the landscape. They have to fit into the landscape. So it was a way of recording the landscape by using the tracks as a way of showing the contour of the Like landscape. a drawing tool, almost. Yeah. Yeah. The first year and a half, I, I would always film on the way back from the spiral jetty. So I'd go there to film, and on the way home, I'd film trains. And then I took a summer, the first summer, and went to Northern California and filmed through the Feather River Canyon and up that way, and then a few shots in the Central Valley. And then I did a number of shots uh, along the ocean. And then a year ago, last summer, I went to New Orleans. You see uh, the train going across Lake Poncha train. And the uh, train that has the uh, baseball game on, that's going across the spillway from Lake Poncha train. So when the, uh, the hurricane came, uh, that spillway was very full of water. Those tracks actually got wrecked and were re repaired. And so I went to New Orleans, and then I went to Mississippi, and uh, uh, Alabama, Tennessee, West Virginia, up to uh, Pennsylvania, New York, then back through Pennsylvania, and then uh, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, um, uh, Nebraska, and then up to Wyoming, where I did the coal train, and then back the last shot that I shot is actually the last shot in the film, which is shot outside of Palm Springs at the, one of the wind farms. I had a very bad car accident in Nebraska where I totaled my car and another car when I didn't see somebody coming 60 miles an hour. And I actually was paying attention, but uh, the person was kind of blocked in my door here. But ne nobody got hurt, luckily, so we just... Uh, I just took my insurance off the car to it. So that, I thought, okay, that may, probably maybe I should quit soon. So, But I rented a car and made shots on the way home, and I even went to the Spiral Jetty and did a sh shot there. Yeah. So I, it didn't stop me from working. The uh, main idea, of course, is to film each train from beginning to end, so I never knew what the shot length would be. It was always determined by the train itself. So I think the longest train in this film is 150-some cars. I, I shot a... uh, 168 trains, and there's 43 oh. <laughs> trains in the film, so I threw away quite a few of them. So I shot with a 400-foot magazine, which would be 11-minute magazine. And there's three shots in the film that are very long. The one that goes across the water in the very beginning across that bridge is about eight minutes long. Um, the longest train is the loop where the train goes into the tunnel and loops over itself. That's almost 11 minutes long. And then the th second longest is about 10 minutes long, and that's that car train in Milwaukee that goes underneath the bridge. It's like an industrial factory area. It's the, like the fourth last shot in the film. Um, so. When I knew there were long trains on the line, I would have to start with a full magazine. But if when I was on the road many times, I would shoot something, and I at first I wanted long trains, but then I was getting too many of them, and I didn't want the, the film to be bogged down with all the, the long trains, so I tried to get a variety of lengths. And I never knew when I was down to like 200 feet especially if I was on a track where the train only comes once a day, let's say, and uh, you're thinking, okay, I'm waiting all day long, and I have 200 feet so I can get a train that's a, almost six minutes long. What if it's six minutes and 10 seconds, and I can't get the train, I waited all day? Do I take the film out and load in a... F so it, it actually became a problem to figure out how to fit trains into a 11-minute 11, 11 roll. And I never knew what direction the train would be coming in either. So uh, it was a lot like going out and fishing. You set up and then just wait for to get a nibble, you know, and hopefully it'll be the one that you want. 
Um, I waited for a day and a half for the longest, and that, and that actually was uh, on the Hudson River, and that line was a line that there should have been a train every uh, every hour or so, and, but they were working on the tracks, and hence I ended up filming the truck that was going to work on the tracks rather than the train. Um, and it kind of reads like a joke, but I saw so many of those that I thought I should at least have one of them in the film. And and, uh, and I thought no matter where I have it, it'll be funny, so I'll have to live with that. I had no idea we'd get an a empty uh, uh, container train, and I was set up very low, and it was the ideal train to come through at that time. That's why it didn't get thrown away, because it, it turned out to have a framing that the, the train then fit into. That didn't always happen, of course. Uh, sometimes uh, it would be completely wrong. And I didn't want to duplicate a shot that I had earlier, where the train comes towards the camera, and it's very close. And it was container trains where you see in between the cars, and you see a white building behind. So I didn't want to make a shot like that again, or that it would be a close-up of a train, and it would be about the space in between the train. And in this, this case, it became about the space under the train, because when the um, containers weren't there, the light from the, the sky is shining down through them, and you had this um, kind of orange color shadow underneath that was only there because there wasn't containers on the train. So uh, uh, a number of times I didn't know what would happen. There's a shot at the end of reel two where the train goes down. It's, I'm very close to it again. And there's a canyon, and it goes through the frame and to the end of the frame, and I hold on it. But that train, the, the rail is loose, and the rail goes up and down. I don't know if, how many of you noticed that or not, but I'm s sitting right next to the train noticing the rail going like this, and the cars are kind of wobbling, and it's making a particular noise because of that. So um, a number of times I had no idea what I, what I would be capturing. I don't want to give the wrong impression that I just was totally always randomly setting up the camera. Uh, uh, the shot in Utah where the train is very small, I knew that road a lot from coming back from uh, uh, filming at the Spiral Jetty, so I knew at some point I wanted to do a shot there where the train would be very small and it, it, the ground is undulating and it hides the train slightly. And I, I knew I wanted to do a shot that the train was uh, at a very far distance, and I knew I wanted to do close-ups, and I knew I wanted to do some from above. And for more than half the shots, I. I you know, composed and actually knew what would happen. And if the train came the wrong way, I just wouldn't shoot it. I'd wait for uh, one to come the other way. But I also wanted to be partly uh, unprepared. So I would have these fortuitous events happen that, that one can't plan on. When I edited the film, I was very aware that uh, Every shot is about trains, and I was, uh, um, but I, I was aware that this this could accumulate into something that would be quite boring, and that uh, you would think, oh, I'm only seeing trains. So the the idea of editing it was to start very slowly. To have the first four or five shots are quite long, and that by having a very slow rhythm to begin with, it would be the most challenge. Those would be the most challenging shots. And I thought that by challenging the audience very early, that then they would s start to see other things in the shots b besides the trains, that the landscape would start to emerge out of that. Um, you would see a fish jump in the water if you were paying attention, or a boat going across the water. And uh, it, your gaze at the train would be taken away by these just very little minor details that would happen in these, these shots that could one could start to space out on because this train has taken so long to get over that bridge. But I wanted you to have that that experience very early so uh, you would uh, understand that, well, it isn't just about the trains, that one can look around the frame and start to see something besides that. 
Well, I had the four-hour cut first, and I was—I thought I'd be the only one that could watch that. I mean, I, I think an hour and 55 minutes is quite a bit. You start to get a headache from the noise. Um, but I, I just uh, had a long cut, and then I started to whittle it away and, and uh, threw away uh, as many good shots as, you know, they, they are almost all really interesting. So it was somewhat different, difficult to do that, but it was also a matter of picking different kinds of trains, uh, uh, different locations, uh, and trying to get rid of some of the redundancy that I had in the, uh, the longer cut, which I actually liked when things were very similar. That would because it, it it is that way. You know, there's a lot of trains that look alike and and go through similar landscapes. And I, at first, I wanted to portray that, but then in the end. The main criteria was to try to uh, get as many different landscapes mm -hmm. as I could possibly get. I pretty much mapped into the film uh, the same percentage of trains that I saw. There's one train that's a piggyback train. A piggyback train is a train that has flat cars and they load the uh, trailers from semi-trucks on them and they just kind of clip on. And I didn't see many piggyback trains anymore because uh, the, uh, the double stacks and the single stack trains are most prevalent at this time and uh, are at, at least as much as the old box cars and that. And uh, so there's only one of those and there's only one road railer because I didn't see a whole bunch of those either. And then uh, there's so many more freight trains than uh, we don't have many. Uh, the only passenger trains in the U.S. now are Amtrak, and they have like six lines in the whole whole U.S., so uh, they're very few compared to the amount of uh, freight trains. So I, I felt that out of 43 trains, that's even pushing it, that you would uh, <laughs> see a, an Amtrak. Uh, there's a lot of commuter trains, of course, especially on the East Coast, uh, and but not many in California, so I found it unusual that there's a, a commuter train in the Central Valley where I made El Valley Central and so I, I included that because it seemed to be such an unusual train it was brand new and it made a nice noise with its whistle and I liked everything about that train. I had to work to get trains without graffiti was the, the main uh, pr problem. The one that has the most beautiful graffiti is, sh is shot in Stevens Point, Wisconsin and that's where that brick building is, that it has kind of an edge on it. It's a place that makes uh, doors and windows, it says on the building. Mm -hmm. And that's a, an, an old train with really old boxcars, and those are just filled with graffiti. And one of those boxcars has a bright green door and a uh, it's almost hand painted the whole box car. Well, I filmed that box car uh, two summers earlier in, in Milwaukee. Uh, when I f uh, was remaking One Way Boogie Woogie, so that boxcar is in both of those films. <laughs> and it's totally recognizable. It's absolutely the same one. It's the old Milwaukee Road that goes through um, Stevens Point. But I, when I saw it, I could, when I was filming, I got very excited. <laughs> I thought, oh, one of my characters. <laughs> when I made the film, I... I uh, ran into many rail fans as they're named in, in the US and more than half of them were European <laughs> that came to America to watch the longer trains that we have. So I made lots of uh, European friends while I made this film. <laughs>